Good to see everybody today. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 12. And of course, we're going through, yep, children, you could head out with Miss Becky. All right. And we're going to go verses 7 through 12. And we're in this series called Partnering Together for the Gospel. You know, we are all in this together. We are all in this. Jeffrey, that's for the children. Please sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so God needs us to bind together as his people and to, to all be on the same page. And we're saying, yes, we want the gospel to go out in our neighborhoods, in our families, first inside our homes and the family, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, and then all over the world. You know, we've got missionaries that are... All over the world right now, we just added Dalvino and Iara Souza from Brazil, and they're going to be here in October. He's going to get up, and he's going to speak to us in October, and we're looking forward to that. They're coming up from Brazil, and it's been, I think it's been, man, I think like, I want to say four to six years. It's been a while since we've seen Dalvino, and so, but... We have to do this in partnership. We've got to do it together. We can't do it all on our lonesome. We need each other. We need to learn from each other. We need to grow together and all those things. Now, let's get some context. Let's go back because I'm overlapping what I started last week. Remember I told you I didn't want to speak for two and a half hours? <laughs> and so I said, what we'll do, you know, it's hard to, to preach the Philippians 3 all in one one swipe. And so what I did, I'm taking little chunks because it's got so much in it. And we talked about last week, Paul said, listen, if anybody had bragging rights, it was me. I was highly admired. I had all kinds of accolades. I was, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. And in, of the, you know, I was an Israelite. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And he has that long list of all the things he was. But you know what he said? I tossed those all in the dumpster. I regarded them as rubbish, as trash, uh, as dung. This word was really, I mean, when you use this word in the first century, I mean, it was the stuff that you do not want to be around. I mean, it's Paul saying all that glory, all that admiration. He says, what does it amount to? He said, it's trash, it's rubbish, compared, compared to the excellency of knowing Jesus, to the excellency of glorifying him with our lives. Remember I said last week our lives are, are, excuse me, our lives are only a little tiny button on a string that reaches across the universe forever and ever. That's our lives. And so what we, we need to be getting in our brains God's desire for us in our time on earth. Okay? So that's the context. That's a reminder of where we were at last week. And that's why verse 7 we get here and we've got the word but. He's contrasting. Okay? When you say but, you say, say I'm telling you this but. Okay? But. He's talking about all the things that were gained to him. All that, all the accolades. But what things were gained to me these I have counted loss. I've regarded them as rubbish for Christ. Yet, indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Let me pause there just for a second. Okay, this passage is not in any way talking about how we get to heaven this righteousness that Paul talks about, this passage is not talking about eternal life. Paul's talking about him going from here to here in knowing Jesus. From going from here to having all these wonderful things, you know, uh, given to him. All of the praise and things that Paul loved to receive from other people. See how special I am? He says, you know, that's all rubbish. 
All that matters is I know Jesus and I'm, I know his righteous, I gain his righteousness, his holiness in my life. That's where we're going. Okay, so we need to put out of our minds and I'll say something about that more because this is a tricky passage and most people read it and they think he's talking about, oh, he's talking about being saved, but there's no way that could be and I'm going to show you why it's no way that could mean that. Okay. Okay, so verse 8, Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that, so that, so that I may gain Christ. He says, I've counted all those things I used to revel in, trash, so that... I may gain Christ. And again, not as his Savior. <laughs> hey, does anybody think Paul was still trying to gain Christ as his Savior at this point in his life? I don't think so. Okay? All right? He started the church at Philippi 12 years earlier, and now he's in prison for Jesus. He's not trying. He's not sitting there after all these years of knowing Jesus and say, you know what? I'm trying to, trying to gain him. I'm trying to, no. Notice here, that I may gain Christ and What? that I may gain Christ and, and also, also, be found in him. Okay? When Jesus returns or when Paul dies, either way, if Jesus comes back, I want to be found in him. If I die, I want to be found in him. How, Paul? How do you want to be found? Not having my own holiness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I'm sorry, let me back up here. I got ahead of myself. And be found in him, not at his return, though Paul, <laughs> believe me, Paul wants to be holy at his return. The be found in him here, I spoke out of line here, the be found in him here is in this life. I want to be found in him. I want to gain Christ. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, my own holiness from the law. No, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness or the holiness which is from God by faith. Let me ask you something. Do we need to, to, do we need to live by faith in our day-to-day -day lives to have that kind of holiness? You better believe it. See, this is why it's confusing because this sounds like eternal life here. It sounds like salvation, but no, he's saying, I... I, I want to gain Christ. I want to be found in him. I don't have this like I want it. I don't want just a smidgen of this holiness of God. I want it. I want it amazingly and powerfully. Okay, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You hear that? That I may know him. Okay, again, he's saying, I want to know Jesus powerfully. How powerfully? The same power that raised him from the dead. Now that's power, everybody. For a human being to come alive, that's power. I want to know him with that kind of power. The holiness I want, I want it to have, it take that kind of power to bring it to me. That's the kind of holiness I want, the righteousness. Day-to-day -day righteousness. That I may know him and the power of resurrection. And what else, Paul? What else are you hungry for? The fellowship. That's that word. Communion. Partnership. Oneness. I want to be one with Jesus. And I want to commune. I want to fellowship with his sufferings. And now all of us say, say what? <laughs> Paul, are you telling Jesus you want to suffer like he suffered? And Paul's like, Yes, if that's what it takes to know him and to glorify him and magnify him. And again, I'm not saying Paul's begging to be put on a cross, okay? You get what I'm saying. He's wanting to say, Jesus, if somebody smacks me in the jaw for giving the good news out, I want to be able to take that. If somebody laughs at me or mocks me or humiliates me, I want to, I want to wear that as a badge of courage that... That's all right, Jesus. I'll take that. I remember when I was a new Christian, 
I was working in a steakhouse and grilling steaks night after night, and I was telling all my coworkers about Jesus and how he had saved me and everything. And guess what? I got a call from the boss one day, and he called me and he said, Hey, Bob, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to let you go. Oh, really? Why? Wasn't I, wasn't I grilling the steaks right? Didn't, was, weren't they excellent? No, they were great. He said, you're awesome. You, you clean up and you do everything great. And so I said, okay, so why, why are you letting me go? He said, because you're always talking about Jesus. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, all right. I'm so sorry and uh, I'll let you go, but uh, I understand. And so I got off the phone and listen, I had been memorizing that verse that said, Blessed are you when men will revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. And man, I was just a new baby Christian. I was like, yes, yes, yes. I was so happy because I felt like that verse was coming true. I was getting fired for sharing the good news. So, you know what? All God wants of us is faithfulness. You know, whether people listen to us or not, that's irrelevant. I wish everybody listened to me because you know what? Whoever believes in Jesus has everlasting life. That's the greatest news that a person could ever believe. But you know what? Jesus said, few there be that find it. Did you hear that? Jesus said, few there be that find the grace of God. Absolutely free. Most people are hung up on like, oh man, if I don't walk the walk and talk the talk and give and do all these things, I'll never make it. And that's just so sad. It's so sad. Jesus paid it all. So Paul's on fire here. He says, Lord, I, I even want the fellowship of your sufferings. Verse 11, next slide. If, notice if, this isn't a given. This isn't automatic for every Christian. It's if. If, by any means, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. See, Paul said, you know what? The kind of resurrection power that I'm hungering for, this is something that's not a given. It's an, it's an if. You've got to be so in tune with God. And again, I'm not saying that this is out of reach for human beings, but it's not a given if by any means. I may attain. Notice he's trying to get there to the resurrection from the dead. And this is very special. We're going to talk about this a little bit. He says, verse 12, not that I have already attained. You see that? He's not talking about salvation. He says this whole thing's about I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. There's more power of his resurrection. There's more Jesus I want to know. I've, I'm still trying to attain where I want to be. Wow, and listen, everybody. If Paul's saying he hasn't gotten there yet, where does that leave me and you? He's an apostle. So what he's doing is he's setting the tone for all of us. Man, we need to get on fire for the things that Paul was on fire for, the things that Jesus was on fire for. And it's not a given if, if. You know, not, all, not everybody gets there. But you know what? We ought to all be shooting for that. Okay? All right, now. Oh, I didn't finish. <laughs> I'm sorry, verse 12. Not that I have already attained uh, or am already perfected. Basically, he's saying there, I'm not finished. Not finished yet. But I press on that I may lo lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. See, he says, I know Jesus. He's already laid hold of me, but I'm still wanting to lay hold of something that he has for me. Okay? All right, let's jump in with a story. I love starting with stories. And this goes back a long time. Born in 1918, Bob Feller. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, was that in 1941, Brother Jim? Is that right? December 7th, 1941? When Pearl Harbor was bombed in Honolulu, one of the Americans who volunteered to serve in the World War II in the armed forces was Bob Feller. But Bob Feller was a 23-year-old pitcher for the Cleveland Indians. 
He was a phenomenon. He's only 23. He's already got a no-hitter under his belt. He's already, at the age of 23, won 107 baseball games as a pitcher. Now, if you don't understand that, if a pitcher nowadays wins 20 games, he's considered at the top of the league. Okay? A pitcher in our league today wins 20 games. You, he had to have won 20, 20, 20, 20, and then five more. That's five years for 100, and then 107, was it? Yeah, 100. So five years at 20 games a year, 20 games a season, and then seven more in the sixth year. That's off the charts. That's all. Nobody's doing that today. Nobody's winning 20 games. He was his own special pitcher in his day. Okay? Now, he's 23. He's in his peak years as an athlete, but he gave up his peak years. 23, 24, 25, 26. Those peak years where you're at your best. You're, you're the strongest. Your eyes are the best. Your reaction is the best. He's giving those up to go shoot down planes in the Pacific. He's a pilot. Okay? Now, when he comes back, <laughs> when he comes back, he hasn't lost his edge at all. Because listen to this. When he returns, probably, what, 45, 46, serving the country for four years, he went on. He already had a no-hitter. Guess what? He throws three more no-hitters. Wow. Three more no-hitters. Listen to this. He threw 12 one-hitters. 12 one-hitters. In other words, he had 12 games where the other team only got to first base or, or got on base one time in the whole game. That's amazing. And not only that, he had won 107 games, went into the war, he wins 159 more games after that for a total of 266 victories. Now, they cost him... Those years in the service, they cost him. He wasn't there to pitch. He wasn't there to win hundreds of games in those four years, or at least like between 80 and 100. He wasn't there. He undoubtedly, you know, endured injuries. He didn't get to work out probably like he wanted to work out because he was just in the war. And in 1999... When the people in the baseball know we're looking back at the entire 20th century from 1900 to 1999, they're saying, okay, who are the greatest pitchers? And believe it or not, because of the number of games he had won was only 266, two other pitchers beat him out. They, shouldn't have, they should have taken into account that he had lost four years, but apparently they didn't. And so, to this day, people argue that Feller may have been the most underrated baseball player of his time. Now, Feller was one time asked if he regretted, if he had regretted his wartime service. Okay, he's looking back 55 years after he, he's been retired 55 years, basically, do you regret that you went out and fought for the United States of America? Or do you regret that? Here's what he said. I just had it on there. He said, no. I've made many mistakes in my life. That wasn't one of them. You know, I suspect that most sports analysts would say that he messed up by going to war. Okay? To give up four prime years of pitching doesn't make any sense from a human viewpoint. But Bob Feller didn't see it that way. He not only got those three no-hitters, the 12 one-hitters, 159 more wins, and guess what? In 1948, just three years after the war ended or somewhere in there, he won, a, he won the World Series as a pitcher. The World Series, he won it all. I mean, this guy, he's like, no. He says, my time in the service was not loss. It was gain. It was gain. So Bob Feller, in a way, he reminds us of the Apostle Paul. He reminds us of the Apostle Paul. Before Paul was saved, he was so greatly admired and praised by others. But once he met Jesus, he counted things like that as rubbish compared to serving Christ and fighting the enemies of Jesus. 
You say, Pastor Bob, Jesus has enemies? You better believe it. <laughs> There's a whole unseen world, let alone his enemies on earth, that want to mock him and, and just use his name in vain and so on and so forth. All right. Jeffrey, did you bring my coffee? Thank you, bro. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. So, so, this morning, what I want, what I want to do is I want us to look at the reasons why. Why did Paul do this? Why did he just count all of these things in his life as loss, as not important, as garbage on Jesus' behalf? Why did he do that? And so the title I've given today, let me find this here, is Why Paul Counted or Regarded All Things as Loss for Jesus. So this is good for us to know. Why did he why? Not just he says, hey, I counted those all loss. And then he goes on to another topic. He, he stops and he says, people of God, here's why. If you know this, you're going to get some inside, inside uh, insights. All right, so let's pray together. And then we're going to get right into this. Father, thank you, Lord, for our time to worship and adore you in song, Lord. Thank you for this time to come together and to be together as a family. And Father, we need each other so much. This morning, Lord, I pray and ask that you would use these words, Lord, my words, but your word, Lord, more importantly, in all of our lives. And Lord, we ask these things in your mighty and wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. All right, if we go back about 30 years, many, many years ago, Kelly and I lived down in Florida for just under three years, and I went to help my father in the faith out get his youth ministry off the ground, And but God called me back to Dallas, called me back to the same church, the church about that time, two and a half years or so in. They call, call me on the phone. And I think it was Mark O'Brien that called me, I believe. But he said, Bob, is there any chance that you might be able to come back to Dallas? And I said, that's funny that you ask. I said, let me pray about that, and I'll get back with you. And so prayed, talked to Kelly, we prayed, and then we made the decision. Lauren had just been born. Lauren was born the year before we came back. So she was only a year old when we came back to Dallas. But nonetheless, when we were down in Florida, uh, one of our favorite couples in the church, they had a daughter in our youth group, and that they would have us over, and uh, Leslie, they made the best Italian food. They're from Italy, okay? Gofredo and Daria. Oh, man, we'd go over there. You know what? It's great when you're really young, you know, because, like, pasta and stuff, your metabolism, you could just eat and eat and eat till you can't eat anymore. And guess what? Nothing happens. It just gets burned up miraculously. But you know what? Then you turn like, I don't know, 28 or something. You get a certain age, and then just all of a sudden, then you get furniture disease. You guys know what furniture disease is? It's when your chest drops down in your drawers. That's what furniture disease. You get furniture disease, and then you're like, and you're like, oh, man, okay, there, let me have a slice of that, you know, Parmesan or whatever. Okay. So anyway. Gofredo and Daria, he cut hair for a living, okay? By the way, he didn't cut hair with scissors. He, cut, he always got me a little bit nervous because he used a straight razor, one of those long things, you know, with just one edge on it, razor sharp. He used a straight razor to cut hair, and he cut hair. In fact, I'm going to put it on the screen. It's been in the news this week. He cut hair in downtown Palm Beach, Florida, which is only blocks away from Mar-a-Lago. Kelly and I have been to, we haven't been in Mar-a-Lago. Now, we've been in the beautiful hotel that's near Mar-a-Lago. Uh, the, uh, what is it called, Kelly? The, the Palms or something. It's beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I got invited to do a wedding down there. The, the dad of the bride was 100 grand or 200 grand poorer after that wedding. But Oh, my goodness. I mean, now that night, I didn't care about my metabolism. I was like, all night long. <laughs> Man, I was like, I died and went to heaven. And like they had Casey and the Sunshine Band or somebody for the music that night. I was like, uh, <laughs> okay, all right. 
So anyway, but he was in this fancy place right by Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort and his home. And he had a thick Italian accent, Gofredo did. And he would get people in the chair and see, I know these things because I would go over to his apartment. They would have dinner with the family and their daughter was in the youth group and then he'd say, okay, Bob, time to get in the chair. So he'd get in the chair, he'd take his straight razor out. Man, I mean, when he did your hair, when he cut it, it was just like masterpiece. It was perfect. Oh my goodness. That's why he could get a job where he got it, where he's probably getting $4,000 a haircut. But anyway, he's, he's working out there with all these billionaires and millionaires. In Palm Beach, listen, there is, phew, I can't tell you, it's just miles and miles and miles of mansions. It's Miami and that whole area all over in South Florida, it's off the charts. Well, anyway, these billionaires and millionaires would get in the chair and the first thing they would do, they'd start talking to him and they'd say, Gafredo, guess what? Where we've been the last three weeks? Oh, we've been to, we've gone, we flew over to Europe and we were here and then we went over to, you know, we were in Paris and then we went over here to Switzerland and then we flew down and we went to, you know, down and they're, they're, they're telling him all these stories. And, you know, it takes them about five or ten minutes to go over all they've done in just the last month, right? And Gafredo, listen, he's Italian. He, he's He's not just going to say, oh, that's wonderful. You know, he, when he was listening to all that, he's just like, oh. And anyway, so, and I don't, I don't really know how he got people to come back to uh, get their hair cut again, but no kidding. They'd get done. He was very patient, just cutting. And then they'd get done talking, and they'd say, you know, and they'd get done, and they're, wait they're waiting for him to say, oh, my, I wish I could do that. And right? And no, Gafredo goes, that doesn't impress me at all. He says, you know what? We're just one pile of dirt talking to another pile of dirt. That's what we are. And I'm like, he, and he told me, I, I mean, I, that's one of those, like almost the only story I could remember him telling me how he would tell these rich people that were just piles of, and he's right. Dust we were made to dust we're going to return. And he's saying, listen, he just basically, he was just saying, my opinion, okay, you gave me your opinion. My opinion is that doesn't impress me at all because like his attitude would be, what impresses me is humility and godliness and bringing joy to the heart of God. Okay, he wasn't being mean to him. He was just being honest from his humble <laughs> opinion. Well, anyway... He was right about human riches, about glamour, and all those things. And last week, as we showed you earlier, Paul says, I'm counting that, all those things like rubbish, they don't really matter. If God gives it to you, then you have to take that, and you need to be faithful with it to invest it in God's kingdom work. Okay? The Bible doesn't say, Paul, when Paul was giving God's instructions about riches, Paul said to God's people, Paul was telling Timothy to tell God's people. Timothy, tell God's people, tell those who are rich in this world to not be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. In other words, everything that you and I have is from God's hand. Paul, I mean, Job said he gave and God. Yeah. Okay. So Paul says, you know what? Fame, fortune, people fawning over me. That's Paul. He's the Pharisee of the Pharisee. He's like, we're just one pile. <laughs> anyway, you get the cut. Okay, so why? We said why. Why, why, why did Paul count these things as garbage? Okay, three things. Number one, okay. He counted all things loss. All the admiration, all the rich, he counted them as loss, as garbage, so, so that he might gain Jesus as a teacher and a friend and a shepherd and a help. You just name it, fill it in the blank, okay? Notice here, you don't see it in our English Bibles because they don't, and they should. They should do this because hina, H-I-N-A in Greek, that, hina, is so that, for this purpose, 
I counted him lost for this purpose, that I may gain Christ. I may get to know him. I may get to understand him. I may get to please him. So that, that's why I did it. Why did you do this, Paul? So that, for this purpose, I may gain Christ. Okay? I love John 14, 21. Jesus says the same thing that Paul says, but he said it first. <laughs> it's in the, with the 11, the night before he dies. He says, he, or the one, the person, this is men and women, the person who has my commandments. Okay, question everybody. Do we, do we have God's commandments? Huh? Yes, we do. We have them. We've got every one of them. You can just take a highlighter and every time God says, do not, do not, do this, don't do this, do this, don't, you know, we could highlight it. We have his commandments. But the person who has my commandments and, now notice this is an important and, and keeps them. It is he or she who loves me. And he or she, the person who loves me, will what? This is, this is a special blessing here. This is, see, because you have to obey his commandments to get this blessing. He who loves me, he who obeys my commandments, will be loved by my Father. And you get a second blessing. I will love him or her. And the third blessing, manifest. Whew. Manifest myself to him or her. Hey, listen, you know what? I don't want to just open my scriptures up or punch the button on my phone and I listen and listen and listen to God's word, okay? I don't, I don't do that just because I want to hear words. I'm like, Lord, please open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your law, okay? I want my eyes opened and I want him to manifest. See, this is a special, basically what, wait, basically what Jesus is saying here, everybody. If you don't care really about obeying Jesus, well then, don't count on God loving you with a special love. He'll love you because you're his child and he'll always love you. Okay? He'll never stop loving you because you're his child. But guess what? As you know, in a large family, and Jesus has got a fairly large family, he's going to have people in his children in his family that are his favorites. And I don't mean in, in an unjust way or an unfair way. God's never unfair. I'm talking about, okay, think about it. If you have a child, and that child wants to come over and snuggle up on you and, and lay their head back on you and say, I love you, Daddy, I love you, Mommy. Okay, obviously, if the other, if you have another child that's like, you know, and, and all the time is just like, whoa, handful, okay, you get the idea, okay, that one that's always coming up, and, and you're like, my grandson, oh my goodness, talk about, all of my grandchildren, but he just melts your heart, man, like, sometimes, Kelly, you remember when he gets that look in his eyes, and it's just like the most humble, he's just like, and he's like, he's, He's like humbling himself when you say something to him. And I'm just like, oh, my heart melts into the midst of my bowels, man. I mean, it's just so awesome. And that's what we're talking about here. God says, hey, listen, my father, you'll be loved of my father, and I will love you. You'll be so special to me. We'll have a special relationship. And I'm, you know what? I'm going to sit with you. And when you read scripture, I'm going to manifest myself to you. That's why Paul said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He says, I don't want just to be in God's family. I want to be that one that, like the Apostle John, gets to lay his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper and just gaze up into his eyes and his face. That's what we're talking about here today, okay? Tony Evans said this. I love Tony Evans. If you listen to your radio station, oh no, if you listen to your, 
He, you know what? He doesn't ever bring his voice down. <laughs> He's always got the pedal to the metal on his voice. If you listen to your radio station in your car, you know that the further you get... Okay, I'll just read it. If you listen to a radio station in your car, you know that the further you get from the broadcast station, the worst reception of, signal, of the signal gets. Many people have difficulty connecting with God because they've wandered too far to pick up his signal. But if you come back home in obedience, relating to God through Christ in love, he will disclose more of himself to you. See, he nailed it. He nailed it. And he's right on. You know, you got the big antenna for, for uh, 1080 in Garland. I got blown away one year and many, many decades ago. I took the youth group skiing and we had a retreat up there at night. We'd preach every night after skiing all day. And KRLD, those things are down here in Garland over there on Saturn Road, those antennas. And guess what? I'm up on the mountaintop in Colorado and I'm looking for something on the radio to listen to. And it's like, K-R-L-D. And I'm like, what? I'm like, they reached all the way to Colorado. Okay? Now, but if you go to Maine, you know what that means. You're not going to hear K-R-L-D in Maine. But nonetheless, that's the first reason. The first reason, Paul counted all things lost. Those things that the earth thinks really matters. Man, fame, fortune, people loving you, people fawning over you. I want people to like me. Hey, you know what, everybody? What we need to start saying, I want Christ to like me. I want Jesus to love me. I want Jesus to manifest himself to me. I'm not really interested. Now, I'm not saying quit your hobbies, okay? If you love to fish, go fish. If you love to play golf, play golf. I'm not talking like that. You know what I'm talking about. I mean, I'm just talking about living a life that doesn't really matter for the kingdom of God, okay? You're not really helping others. You're not encouraging others. You're not blessing others. You know, we're, we're trying to get you moved from here to here spiritually, okay? And so that's what we're talking about. I'm not saying you become a hermit and you wear burlap bags and you sit in your garage when it's 108 outside. If you need to know about that, please see Doug after the service. His air conditioner was out like for two weeks. Okay, that's the first reason. Why did he count that stuff garbage? Because he wanted Jesus as his friend, as his teacher, as his mentor, as his shepherd. Man, he wanted to follow Jesus everywhere. Okay, second thing. Let's go quickly. So that he might find the holiness. Why did he count them garbage? So that he can find the holiness that can come from God alone. You and I can't work this kind of holiness up. Now watch this. I can do this. I can say, you know what? I'm going to quit listening to, to the, my, my Bible on my phone. I'm going to quit reading my Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit going to church and going to Bible fellowship and stuff like that. I got it. I can be just as holy as God wants me to be, and I don't need, I don't need the Bible. I can, I, can, I can work it up. Guess what? Not what we're talking about. And by the way, all you could work up is on something that looks spiritual outwardly. But Jesus said in, inwardly it would be bad news. You'd be like full of dead man's bones because you're not getting the nectar, the juice, the honey from God's word in you. And so you're going to be running on fumes. Hey, if your car runs out of gas... <laughs> You have to put gas back in it for it to run. Our lives can't run without gas. They won't work. You'll be walking everywhere you go. You know, you heard the story, right, about the teenager that was complaining to his dad. And I didn't do this because my dad didn't get on my case in 1979 when my hair was down to here. And because Peter Frampton had his hair permed, I went and got my already thick hair curled, man. And I, I was like, Peter Frampton, I got the Les Paul like he has. I got the hair like he has. I should have the fame that he has. Didn't ever happen. But anyway, and I did it. My dad was not happy. My dad is of the old school, the greatest generation, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. He saw me come home with that hair one day, and he was raking the leaves, and he's like... <laughs> But anyway, 
I didn't, I, my dad didn't complain about it. He just, just endured it. But anyway, one time there was a teenager that was complaining to his dad because the dad wouldn't give him the car keys. And he says, I'll give you the car keys when you get your hair cut. He says, Dad, come on. He says, nope, I'm not budging. You get your hair cut, you get the car keys. Dad, Dad, Jesus had long hair. And he said, and he walked everywhere he went. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea there, okay. We're talking, about, we're talking about a holiness, a holiness that only God can give, okay? Okay, Paul counted the admiration, the accolades as garbage, and he did that, verse 8, whoops, he did that, there it is, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness. Again, we're not gaining Christ eternal life. We're not trying to get a home in heaven. Paul already had that through faith in Jesus for eternal life. He already had that. He says, I'm counting all that old stuff trash so I can get more of Jesus. I can gain him and be found in him. And again, when I first read, I was not thinking clearly. And be found in him in this life, not having my own holiness, righteousness, which is from the law. You know, I'm not getting this righteousness because I'm keeping the 613 commandments of the Old Testament. No, Paul says I'm a New Testament Christian. I'm not leaning on Moses to bring my holiness. It can't. Moses can't bring me that kind of holiness. I need Jesus. But that which is through faith, the holiness which is through faith in Christ, the holiness, righteousness, which is from God by faith. Your day to day. Hey, it says we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. That's right. You don't walk by what you can see, you walk by what you can't see. In other words, you read God's word and you take him at his word. Yeah, but Lord, can you show me? No, trust me. <laughs> I told you what to do. Just do what I say and trust me for everything else. I'm taking care of it. You know, you're on my, you're on my carnival cruise ship here called Earth, but I'm the one steering the boat. I'm taking it right where it needs to go. I've given you the opportunity to walk around the ship and go here and go there, but I'm the one that's taken the entire thing where it needs to go. Trust me. Trust me. You trust me, everything is going to work out much better. <laughs> okay? It's from God by faith. All right? This is talking about practical righteousness, not positional. Positional righteousness is your position before God. What's Pastor Bob's position before God, what's your position before God? I am a child of God. I was born again. I'm God's child, and I will forever be God's child. No man can pluck me out of his hand. I will never perish. I will never perish in hell. I will never come into condemnation. I won't stand before God to be judged for my sins. That can't happen. I'm God's child. Okay? He's, he's got me forever. Somebody says, yeah, but Bob, what if you wanted to give it back? Yeah, salvation's a gift, but what, did you, what if you wanted to give it back? Too bad, you can't. <laughs> God doesn't take it back. It's yours forever. It's just like, a, look, just like a child, say, say a child of ours came up to us one day and said, I'm disowning you and mom. I can't stand you. I'm getting a new name, a new identity, and you'll never see me again. You're no longer my parents. Guess what? Ha, 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 too bad I'm always going to be your dad or I'm always going to be your mom. You can change your name, you can change your hair color, you can change your identity, you can change all that. You could go a million miles away and run away from me, but guess what? I brought you into this life, the mom could say. I bore you. I gave you life. And the dad to a degree. And uh, mom had to do all the heavy lifting, but uh, anyway, uh, but no matter what they do, they have my DNA. They have my DNA and the mom's DNA. Okay? That's right. I love Matthew 11. 
You want a verse that'll help flesh this out for you? Look at this one. Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said. Are you weary? Take my yoke. Okay, you, got a, you know what a yoke is. You got a cow over here, you got a cow over here, and the farmer puts the thing across both of their necks, and they start, they start walking, and they're pulling the plow, right? But this is such an awesome yoke, because on one side of the yoke is you and I. We stick our sorry heads through the hole, and Jesus puts his head through the... Hey, who do you think's going to be doing most of the pulling? Yeah. Yeah, we're just along for the ride. He's got the power, power that raised Jesus from the dead. He says, take my yoke, and this is... Now, let's, let's explain. He's not talking literally about a yoke of wood. He's talking about as a student, as a pupil of his. Disciple is mathetes. That is a student of Jesus, a follower. Take my yoke upon you and, notice, learn, 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 learn from me. Why? Because I am gentle. I'm not like those Pharisees. I don't whip the sheep from behind. Get in line. Come on. Do what you're supposed to do. Come on. Hey, there's a lot of preachers like that. What's the matter with you? And they just scream all the time instead of, you know what, instead of being out front and saying, follow me. Come on. Yeah. I'm going God's direction. You want to go with me? No, these guys are in. See, the Pharisees are out whipping the sheep. Jesus says, I'm gentle. I'm humble. I'm lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy. It's not like, it doesn't give you blisters. My burden is light because I'm doing most of the lifting. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the good shepherds. All these shepherds that have come before me, these Pharisees that are standing around, all those, all those shepherds, they're worthless shepherds. He says, they don't care about the sheep. When they see the wolf coming, they run. I care about the sheep, Jesus says. In fact, he says, I'm the door. I'm the one that's there inside the pen. I'm the one laying there in the doorway. I am the door. <laughs> if anyone will come in through me, he'll be saved. And then he'll go in and out and find pasture, find grass, and get the good things. So Jesus isn't like the shepherds of Israel. Mm -mm. No, they're, they're, they're driving them with the law. Yeah, look, hey, look. Look at how they treated Jesus at the end of his life. They didn't whip him literally, but they were standing there encouraging it. <laughs> the th crown of thorns and so forth. Okay. Okay. I want to just point something out here to you all. I want to point out that word, phrase, the word find. It's, our, it's a Greek word there. It's uh, heurisko. Heurisko. We get the word eureka. They said heurisko. We get Eureka. In other words, ah, I have the answer. He says, you will find. It'll be a Eureka moment. You get in the yoke with me. You get in that yoke and you'll be plowing with me through life. You'll be learning from me because I'm right next to you. We're walking hand in hand and I'm talking to you and you're talking to me in prayer. And guess what? You have a Eureka moment. Oh, that stuff's all garbage. Following Jesus. Living for his glory. Laying up treasure in heaven that'll last forever. Not treasure on earth that thieves break in and steal and that the stock market comes and steals. I'm laying up treasure that'll last forever because I'm serving Jesus. God wants you to have the kind of holiness that comes only from him. Not an outside holiness like the Pharisees drove people into. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing this outward thing of, oh, I've got to be eating the right foods. I've got to be wearing the right clothes. I've got, no, that's all outward stuff. Anybody can do that. A pagan can do that. It's holiness that comes from the inside out because you're in the yoke with Jesus and you're having eureka moments. Oh, The first reason Paul counted all things for loss, all things lost for Jesus, is so that he might gain him as a teacher and a friend and a shepherd. The second reason is so that he might find the holiness that comes from God alone. The third reason here, and our final reason, is so. Whoop, what did I do? Oh, I left, I left the whole slide off. Let's see. 
Dee -dee -dee. Oh, I, I know. I didn't. I actually. I must have skipped something. Okay. Or I put that slide in the wrong place. I'm so sorry. I can go back to it. Okay, here's the third reason. <laughs> The third reason he counted all that stuff that most people think is great as garbage because he wanted to become like Christ. And this is kind of like number two in a way, but it's a little different. That he might become like Christ in every aspect. Okay, let's look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Whoa, being conformed to his death, being in the likeness. Conformity is in the likeness. Paul said, I want to I be in the likeness of his death. He was humble. He was willing to be humiliated. They tore every shred of clothing off. They whipped him with the cat of nine tails 39 times. And all these things they did. And he's, Paul's saying, listen, Jesus, you went through that for me. I want to be willing to go through that for you. Not very many people get to have that honor. But he says, no, but even still, I can still suffer for you, Jesus, even if I don't become a martyr. I'm in jail. They might martyr me, but I may not be. But Lord, I, I don't want to be just conformed at the beginning and in the middle. Lord, as I grow more and more and more, I want to be willing and be able to suffer for you. To suffer, though, hard on the outside, joy in the heart. Joy in the heart, okay? So, first, I want you to notice, Paul trashes the old life because he wanted to know Christ better and better. Second, he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. What does that mean? That's kind of nebulous, isn't it? It's kind of uh, unclear. What's that? To know the power of his resurrection. Listen, he wanted to experience in daily life what it means to, be, to have been resurrected by Christ. He wants to experience that in daily life. Lord, you know the power it took for you to create the universe? Do you know the power it took for you to split the Red Sea? Lord, you know the power it took for you to raise Lazarus from the dead and then to raise yourself from the dead? Humans can't do that, Lord. And so, he says, I want to experience that kind of power coursing through my life, changing me into the likeness of Jesus. Okay? So, let's look at verse 11, because this is kind of tricky. <laughs> Paul says, if, so it's a get, not a given, this isn't going to happen to every Christian, it's not going to happen to every person who goes to heaven, he says, if, I want to know him, I want to know the power of his resurrection, if, by any means, that means, if somehow, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. And by the way, this is a very special word for resurrection. It's got, instead of just the Greek word for resurrection, okay, it has the little uh, prefix ek or ex. Either one is correct. Ek, the out-resurrection. The out -res I want to experience the out-resurrection. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question, Bible scholars. Is Paul here talking about physical resurrection or spiritual resurrection? Okay, let's all say it with one voice. Ready? Spiritual resurrection. <laughs> okay, he's not talking about, oh, Lord, I've just got to be raised from the dead. I'm so scared I might not be after I die. I don't want to stay in the casket. My oh, okay, forever and ever. Okay, he's not, Paul's not sweating that. He knows. He knows. Jesus said, whoever believes in me, though he dies, he will live. You're going to have resurrection life. The moment you see Jesus, or the moment you die, you're going to be raised. And until the return of Christ, when you get your permanent body forever and ever, he's going to do something there. I don't know. We're not told what he does, whether he gives us a temporary body in heaven, or if we just, our spirits like, you know, that everybody can see each other and, you know, well, I don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. But the bottom line is we're not, when we die, we're not sitting there waiting like, you know, in the casket. Hey, Lord, you know, come on, when are you going to return? I, I want to see you. No, you're going to, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, you'll be with him. <laughs> and you'll be conscious, you know, to be present with the Lord and you're still in the, you know, you're still dead. That's no, no bueno. No, you'll be conscious and aware, and you'll get to see your loved ones. Okay. Well, this is spiritual resurrection. Only those 
who with faith in God, day-to-day -day faith, strive for this goal, will attain this kind of spiritual resurrection in this life. In other words, victory, powerful spiritual victory, um, spiritual maturity like off the charts. I'm talking about mega victory here. Okay, you got guys that win an Olympic gold medal, and then you got the Phelps that have like, you know, 30 gold medals. I don't know how many he's got, but he's got, I remember in 1972, Mark Spitz is still doing commercials even now about, uh, about painkillers now because he's in his 70s. But when he was in his 20s, he was in the 72 Olympics. So cool, I got the Sports Illustrated. His waist was like four inches around and it went up like his shoulders were that wide, just muscle on muscle. And he had the seven gold medals strung across on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Man, that was so awesome. You know, I never saw that. I think that my mom had that under her bed or something like that. But anyway, you know, she, she stole all my swimsuit editions. I never saw all my teenage years. I missed all six swimsuit editions of Sports Illustrated. And she stole my Mark Spitz one to keep under her pillow. All the audacity. Okay, so notice, even Paul, even Paul, even Paul says he hasn't attained this goal, okay? I want to wrap it up here, everybody. I know you've been very patient, okay? He, Paul wanted God's people to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I'm going to have to jump ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to go quickly through these last few slides, okay? He wanted to participate in Jesus' sufferings. He wanted to kind of have communion with his, his uh, sufferings. He didn't just want the good times, okay? He's like Job. Job's being pummeled. Listen to me, everybody. Job is a believer in God, and he's being pummeled by terrible things. All ten of his kids have been killed by a tornado. He's the richest man in the world, and he loses everything. So this happens to Job. All ten of his children die. All of his wealth is taken from him, and he, the Bible says, he was the richest man in the world at that time. And then he lost his health. He had sores from the bottom of his feet, boils, boils to the top of his head. Okay? Talk about bad, bad trouble happening and his wife's griping him out. She's saying, Job, if I was in your shoes, Job, I would just curse God to his face and let him kill me. And you know what Job says? Oh, my goodness. Talk about spiritual victory, spiritual maturity. He says, honey, shall we indeed accept good? Okay, I'm a, I was a billionaire. I'm not a billionaire any longer. Should we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Mm. Paul wanted to be conformed to Jesus' death. Whether by life or by death, Christ will be magnified in my body. Jesus magnified his Father in the way he died. Courage, boldness, went to the cross. Father, if you have a cup for me to drink, I'll drink it. In other words, the cup was of sufferings was the cross. He drank that cup. He didn't leave a drop. He died for you and I. And Paul said... Jesus magnified God in the way he died. I want to magnify God in the way I die, whether by living on this earth and helping people or dying with the sword of Nero. Let me close with this story, everybody. 2011, Kelly was given an amazing gift, and I was just a benefactor of it. She was given a trip to Italy by the doctors in her office that she worked for because she worked for 15 years at that point. That was her 15th anniversary. She's the manager and she runs the office for the, the doctors. Okay, so she got this mega trip. And so Kelly, myself, Lauren, and Nicole, we all got to go 11 years ago to Italy for like 10 days. It was the bomb. We went to the city that's got rivers all through it. You know, it's a... Uh, blah, 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 blah. Venice, thank you. And then we got on a train and we went to Florence. Oh my good, the food, the food. And you know the food in Italy, you don't get fat eating. They got special lasagna. Anyway, 
We're eating and eating and it's just glorious and we're seeing all these things that are like thousands of years old and then we got on a train again and we went across the beautiful countryside of Italy and we got to Rome and oh my goodness, you need, you need two or three months in Rome. You cannot do Rome. But we went to the Colosseum. Everybody's got to see the Colosseum, okay? There's the Colosseum. It's half broken down but it's still for being, you know, 2,000 years old. It's amazing. Okay, I'm going to show you what the inside looks like here in a minute. But you know what happened in this Colosseum, right, everybody? This is where they took gigantic popsicle sticks and shoved humans down on those and, uh, and put tar or whatever on them and lit them up. So at night, everybody can see it would light up the stadium. Those were Christians around that stadium inside. And then the Christians that weren't lit up like, like, uh, like a fire, with fire, they were out there because underneath the floor of the Colosseum, there were all kinds of areas for animals, and they would bring animals up, and they would just send these animals. They wouldn't feed them for a week, and they'd send them up there, and the poor moms and dads and children would all be huddled down in the middle of that stadium, and, and you know, uh, 25,000 people, it's a huge thing, 25,000 people got to see them, I think that's right, got to see them uh, gnarled and chewed up and, and swallowed whole. Okay. Nero wanted Christians in that day to publicly proclaim, by the way, they put the floor of the stadium as it would have been a thousand years ago, but they left this open so people could see the compartments. You go out that hole and it comes up a ramp so they can come out and come here, the animals, but all the way around this thing, there are Christians lit up like torches, and then they put the families, the Christian families there in the middle, and they died for Jesus. Nero wanted them to say, Caesar is Lord. But they didn't say that. They said, no, Jesus is Lord. There is a story told that a Christian was being led. Let me see, did I have a... Yeah, by the way, I wanted to point this out. I love this. They put a cross there right in the middle of that Colosseum because they said, get ready, get ready, everybody. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Yes, the evil people did destroy his people, but that's not the end of the story. A judgment is coming, and they'll pay a supreme price for that. But the stories told of that a Christian was being led to the place where he'd be martyred. And as he's being led to the place of his death, this is what he said to his executioners. I love this. They're taking him either out there on the, on the thing or they're going to spear him and torture him with the fire. But here's what the Christian said. He said to the people that were taking him away, you are taking a life from me that I cannot keep, but you are bestowing on me a life that I cannot lose. Let me read that again. You are taking a life from me that I cannot keep, but you are bestowing on me a life that I cannot lose. And folks, just before we pray, I know I've gone mighty long today, but like I said, it's so difficult to go through these passages and to not just pour your heart out. Because God wants you to know, he wants you to know what we should be shooting for. Hey, if you're way over here, you're just putting your toe in the water? Yes. Yes. There was a day. That guitar right there that I was playing this morning, I bought that guitar, $525 in 1979. It's like 2000 today. I bought that guitar, saved up my money, man. I said, I want that guitar. You know, it's like one of the first electric ones that had the fiberglass back on it. Seven days before I put my faith in Jesus. I've got the receipt still. Seven days before. And, and you know what? I wanted to glorify God. I was just brand new, just a new baby Christian. Didn't know hardly anything about the Bible. But guess what? I said, Lord, I want to glorify you. And you know what, everybody? I've been doing that for 43 years. 43 years. And now, I'm farther down the road. But I'm like Paul. 
I have not yet apprehended. I haven't gotten it yet. I haven't attained this yet. But this one thing I do, I press toward the mark. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to, I press toward the mark. And if you're right here like I was, I was there, I couldn't, I couldn't quote a scripture to you. I might have been able to quote, Jesus wept. I maybe might have known that one. But you get the idea. But everybody starts somewhere. So just, be, just go where you're at. Keep coming to church. Start coming to Bible fellowship. You should want to hunger for you, for your children, for your grandchildren, getting everything you can on Sunday and getting that meal, fill in your gas tank so when you go out. Because it isn't like the old days. Man, the old days, God would have, or, or pastors would have the people come back, and God, I mean, he, let's come back on th Sunday night. Let's come back on Wednesday night. Let's come back on Thursday night, and we'll go out and knock doors. And you know what? Now, churches, instead of being the church on the corner where everybody lives 10 feet from the church and you can do things like that, now we're all scattered across the world. Very few of us live in a stone's throw of the church. And it makes it very difficult. Life's gotten very difficult. Now, I suppose if I hung you over hell and said, if you don't do this, you'll go to hell, I'd get two or three more of you to come. But you get the idea. You get the idea. So what I'm saying is, man, when we're having things, yeah, just try to get all that you can. Start here. Keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. And you know what Jesus will say? If you keep going, and let's say you only get this far, but you were doing your best to get this far, if you die... Jesus will say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Or if you get this far, as long as you were... Hey, listen, I believe that... It, let's say if I had died two months after I had become a Christian. I already was working in the youth center. I, I started working with the teenagers. I didn't know what I was doing, but I could play that. And I was using it to teach them verses from the Bible. I put... Or I got songs that had the Bible verses in them. And what I'm saying is, if I had died, I would have gotten to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, I wouldn't have gotten the reward, maybe, of somebody that was doing it for 24 years or 43 years, but you get the idea. I would have, been, I would have heard Jesus' words, well done. So no matter how far we go, if we just keep going throughout our lives... The old song said, when the battle's over, we shall wear the crown in the new Jerusalem. Man, it is going to be glorious. So let's bow our heads in prayer, everybody. Let's bow our heads. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Because I indeed went long today. And I'm going to try to work on that, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Lord, I love your people. Lord, I just want the very best for their lives, for their children. Lord, if they're grandparents for their grandchildren and great-grandchildren, oh, Lord, please continue to help us to grow together, to come together. When the church doors are open, help us to be here and to be taken in everything we can so we can be what you want us to be. If we put a little gas in the tank, we can only go a little distance. But if we fill that tank, Lord, we can go far for you. So let us do that regularly, be filling our tanks, be getting close to the antenna so we could hear you clearly. Jesus, thank you for giving us things to think about, why we should shoot for these things. Why should we do it? And Lord, we'll hear more next week, more reasons. But God, this week, use your people. Use your people. Help them to not be afraid. Help them to invite other people to church. Help them to bring people with them. Whatever they can do, Lord, let's just build this place up with your grace and your strength. Help us, Father. And we pray these things in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen.